7.5 is our lesson today. The structure of Canadian government. What did Confederation achieve for the Canadian system of government? That's what we're going to learn today. So stick around and let's learn something. You know, on the last lesson, I was, uh, my apologies. Um, I had the gain on my mic set really high and it uh, didn't sound as good as it normally sounds. So I do apologize for that. That's why you should always do a mic check, kids. Always do a mic check. And I didn't. So lesson learned. Learn from my mistakes. Welcome to lesson 7.5. What did Confederation achieve for the Canadian system of government. Um, we know from the previous lessons that a lot of compromises were needed um, and uh, there was a lot of back and forth taking place and it did take a lot of work for Confederation to actually happen and to work. And the system was designed to benefit as many people as, as possible. At first, there was only four provinces that felt comfortable in creating this union. And later on, more and more provinces, colonies, provinces decide to join. Uh, and today we've got 10 provinces and three territories that make up Canada. There's an image here. This is the system of the federal government from the BNA Act of 1867. We learned about the BNA Act in the last chapter. And you can see that the British government is still at the top of our government. So the British government still played a very important role during uh, Canada's early history. And if you take a look today, they do still play a role. We have a governor general. It's no longer appointed by the British. Uh, the Prime Minister now appoints the Governor General, who represents the monarch. And it's really is just a symbolic position, but it uh, identifies our close ties and it identifies our history to that of the British monarchy. So we're making it official. Here's another map of Canada. Uh, well, this is the Dominion of Canada, same thing from 1867 and it passed it passed British Parliament in 1867 July 1st 1867 was the official first day of Canada Canada was born if you remember from uh, the last lesson not a single shot was fired in the creation of Canada that is pretty marvelous um, so the Dominion of Canada is now an official country with still really close ties to the British. So for example, Britain still controlled our national defense and our foreign affairs. Okay, that was one of the compromises we are going to have to make. Canada, still part of the British Empire, and the British monarch is still our head of state, as I mentioned in the previous slide with the governor general. Um, but now that's more of a symbolic uh, position gesture. Parliament gets divided into two parts. We have an elected House of Commons. So we, the voters, any Canadian citizen today over the age of 18, elects and votes, votes for people to be elected into the House of Commons. And we also have a Senate. A Senate is appointed in, if there's a vacant seat, a Senator is appointed by the Prime Minister and stays there for life until they die or until they hit the age of 75, at which point they can retire. The seats in the House of Commons, they are determined by rep by pop. So this is one of the compromises that needed to be made. And therefore, Ontario and Quebec had more representatives. But the Senate was based off of region. And you see on the map here, these are the Senate seats. The goal of the Senate is to give a voice to the much smaller regions in Canada. At the time, would have been New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. That's why they have 10 Senate seats each, even though today they have a very small population compared to our province here uh, in Alberta, which we only have six Senate seats. So the Maritime provinces have more 
um, seats than us here in Alberta. The Senate not only is to give voice to the smaller regions at the time, but today it's also used as uh, protection of the voices of minorities. So the Senate is there to watch out for them. And the BNA Act established our federal system of government. So our central government, um, our federal government, they manage the affairs and matters that are affecting the entire nation, the entire country. And then each individual province has their own government that manages their own local affairs and their own regional matters. Okay, so uh, anything that needs to happen specifically for a province that's only really affecting individual provinces, that is provincial jurisdiction. If something is affecting the entire country, well, that is a uh, federal uh, jurisdiction. But Canada in 1867 was seen as a limited democracy. At the time, only citizens over the age of 21 could vote, which is fine. Okay, as long as you include everyone over the age of 21, but they didn't. You had to be over the age of 21. You had to own property or you needed to rent large amounts of land. Married women at the time could not vote. And at the time, few single women, and especially those who were visible minorities, very few owned property. First Nations, Métis, Inuit, they couldn't vote. So when you crunch the numbers, when it all said and done, only about 11% of the population at the time in 1867 could vote. 11% of the population is, you know, determining the future for the least next four or five years anyways of where Canada is going. So we've made some changes since then. We've made a lot of changes since then. Today, in order to vote, number one, you must be a Canadian citizen. Number two, you have to be at least 18 years of age on election day. And the third thing, you need to prove who you are and where you live. That's all you need today. You don't have to own property. You don't have to rent large amounts of land. Doesn't matter if you're married, single, who cares, right? It doesn't matter if you're a visible minority. None of these things matter. As long as you are a Canadian citizen and you are at least 18 years old. That's today. Canada believes in peace, order, and good government. Not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness like in the United States, but peace, order, and good government. And one of the compromises that needed to be made, and this was George Brown's idea, we learned this in the last lesson, the federal system allowed, this was important, the federal system allowed provinces to control their own matters because each province had their own unique identity. We in Alberta are different from the maritime provinces. We in Alberta are different from all the other provinces. We have a lot of similarities, yes, but we're also very unique. And the federal system of government allows for that. The founders wanted a strong central government because they were scared of having a civil war. So they wanted to avoid the civil war at all costs. So we need to make a strong central government. And that's what the BNA Act did. It allowed for the federal government to make laws for what the title is here, peace, order, and good government. So the, it includes on the chart, under federal powers, defense, the postal service, trade and commerce, weights and measures. So that's like your pounds, kilograms, uh, kilometers, miles, things like that. Currency, taxation, navigation, the fisheries, any kind of copyright laws, banking. Okay, they all fall, have to follow the same rules. First Nations is on there, and you will learn more about that later in grade seven, and you'll look into more detail in grade nine. Criminal law, naturalization, marriages and divorces, residual powers. Now, a residual power are the unknowns. So what could possibly happen that we don't even know exists yet? So the unknowns of the future. So TV, internet, air travel, phones, let's say, for example, uh, these are current things. They didn't know about this stuff back in 1867, but they knew that new things would eventually happen. And when those new things did happen, that will fall underneath the federal jurisdiction. And the, under the federal powers, you have the power to cancel any provincial law that goes beyond the bounds of their own provincial powers. 
okay? And then this leads the way much later to 1982, the creation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. You definitely talk about that a lot more in grade nine social studies. Provincial powers, we've got property and civil rights. So our laws, our civil laws are different here than they are in other provinces. Same with property rights and property taxes too. Education falls to the provinces. Local works, so your roads and things like that. Highways will be a provincial thing. Okay, each province is responsible for their own highways. Same with their hospitals and their cities as well. Plus their courts too. And each individual province is going to be responsible for their own policing as well. So provincial policing as well as local policing. And at the time in 1867, there were some shared powers that existed, that of agriculture and immigration. That, my friends, we are now in Canada. Canada is now created in our story of Canada. We are now an official country. We can have a party and a celebration. We've made it. Canada is now a country. This is the end of Unit 1. Now we look forward to Canada after Confederation. Head over to your notebook now and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.